Okay, excellent. Can you hear me okay? Really good, thank you. All right, that sounds good. Well, thanks everybody for joining uh, for this, uh, this webinar on sharing in social leadership. Um, this is going to be uh, perhaps a slightly reflective session, if I'm honest. Sharing is always one of the areas of social leadership I've found harder to, um, to share ideas about because uh, I guess uh, on the one hand, sharing is a pretty obvious thing. We all know what sharing is. So I'm trying to almost impose a structure on this uh, so that we can build it into a, a development framework when we're thinking about it. So uh, I'll share uh, what I have so far as part of our explorations of the social age and, uh, and we'll see where we get to. I should also share that um, I'm trying a new setup today. Uh, well, I tried this over the last couple of webinars, so uh, you may have seen me do this before, but I'm using the iPad and the Mac because there's a uh, new feature that's working on Zoom that lets me annotate uh, slides as we go if I am feeling enthusiastic and can multitask. So um, we'll see how that goes. I might do some annotating. So if you see me looking to the side, it's because I've got my iPad on this side. Um, so hold on, you're asking about my camera. You should be able to see my video. Uh, I am broadcasting it and I'll tell you what I'm doing. I'm broadcasting from the laptop and I'll show you why because if I uh, also share my video from the iPad um, what you'll see is when I'm drawing I completely obscure the camera so so I'll stop that video stream okay so uh, as Sam said we're here on the fifth of these running through uh, social leadership on sharing the, um, the model of social leadership is circular because uh, I guess because we, um, it's not, uh, we're not saying there's a platform you get onto, it's about uh, we continuously develop. So it's a little bit artificial to say that there is a, um, a structure, but what structure there is works something like this. Uh, we talked in the earlier webinars about curation, about choosing your space. And then about storytelling, understanding how stories work, um, individual stories, co-created stories, and organizational stories. And so this piece on sharing comes after that. And I quite like how it's sandwiched between um, storytelling and community, because the context that I'm talking about sharing in is how we share wisely, not just widely. So that's one of our core notions for today, I guess. How do we add more signal rather than simply more noise? And why is that important? Well, mainly because as social leaders, we should always seek to be adding signal. We may actively be aiming to share less with fewer people, but ensuring that those things we do share are relevant, timely, and crucially are interpreted um, to be of meaning to the person that we're sharing it with. So I guess in that sense, I'm talking about sharing. It's a very active and reflective process, not simply hitting send or copying and pasting a link. As ever, I'll, I'll share a warning slide, um, a working out loud session. Well, I've already said I'm, I'm reserving the rights to be a little reflective in this one because uh, I've pulled together a range of material both from the social leadership handbook and from the 100 days book um, but i'm also uh, just thinking about it as we go along so i might throw a few new thoughts in there and very much co-creative we're only a small group today so please do um, feel free to throw any uh, questions in as we go i'll make sure we have time at the end but if you have questions in i'll happily, uh, I'll happily share them um, and answer them as we go so um, this is one of the illustrations that I've put together for the 100 Days of Social Leadership book. And I started with this because it speaks to one of the core notions of social leadership. Um, you could almost say social leadership is about leading within and alongside your community rather than leadership 
imposed upon a community. And why would we want to do that? Well, mainly because communities are sense-making entities, or at least a coherent and high-functioning community is a sense-making entity. And what does that mean, you know, the notion of sense-making? Well, partly it's just about finding the meaning in things and finding it from a, a broad perspective. So understanding from all of these different sources of knowledge, from all of these different inputs, and from all of the different contexts that we bring to a conversation, what is important within that and what should we do about that. So at the heart of social leadership is the notion that you don't have to do it alone. You have a community that can bring different perspectives, can bring both challenge and support, can act as a filter, and can help you with this collective sense making. But of course, a corollary of that is that if we want this incredible community around us, we'll have to curate it. We'll have to build the type of community that we want to be in. We'll have to invest in that community, but not in a transactional way. This isn't about saying, I'll answer your question today if you answer my question tomorrow. It's about saying, I'll try to help you be successful today because investing in the community is what a social leader does. And at some point, I may ask questions of my community. I may ask for help from it. And if I've invested in it in the right way, then hopefully the community will be able to support me as such. So we're kind of banking our investment over time and we're earning a reputation over time. But a core aspect of social leadership is enabling us to see beyond our own biases, our own knowledge, our own conception and understanding. So it's allowing us to sort of push our ignorance collectively further back. I thought I'd better start with a, a fairly obvious aspect of uh, curation. It's certainly the, the term it's used most widely in um, especially social learning and organizational learning, is curating content. So choosing something and sharing it out into the system. Indeed, many uh, technologies of social learning measure the effectiveness of what they're doing by the volume of stuff which is shared. So every time somebody shares something, it notches up a point and they consider that that's a win. And if somebody likes something, that's considered a win. That's a bit of a shallow view, really. It's measuring a transaction and it can encourage behaviors where we just fire stuff out into the ether, where we just send things out there. I think a reflective view of sharing would be that we don't just throw it out there, but we, which is the sort of junk food approach, but instead we add some seasoning you know, we add some value to it. So probably any time we're curating something to share, we should also be thinking about interpretation. Why am I sharing it? What story do I think it tells? How do I think this can help you? If I don't know the answers to those questions, I may need to ask myself, why am I sharing it? Is it just because it's of interest to me? But if I can't think about why it may be of interest to you, perhaps I shouldn't share unless I'm choosing to share my own uncertainty. It might be that I share something and say, I'm not sure what to think of this. Can you help me figure it out? I had two examples uh, yesterday, actually, on a call with the group talking about this, where one person said they shared a, an article about password security into their community, which is an IT community. And she found she was sort of ridiculed and put straight because those people with a deeper technical expertise um, rapidly jumped on it and pointed out the faults in what she was sharing. And for me, that's, although she's shared something and, you know, notched up the point for sharing, it doesn't demonstrate a culture of sharing. In fact, what she really learned from all of that was not to bother sharing stuff. The social consequence of the group ridiculing her taught her not to share. The other story that came up yesterday that I quite enjoyed was 
talking about kindness, the importance of kindness within a system. And another person on the call said, oh, I, I guess it is okay to share those kind of stories. It's okay to recognize people, to thank people. That in itself was quite interesting because all of us are aware of the importance of being kind. But in a certain organizational culture, we can perhaps feel that it's a weakness or that it's not acceptable. So understanding the social context of sharing is particularly important. And perhaps from our individual perspective as social leaders, we should be thinking, are we, you know, are we sharing the junk food or are we sharing something with uh, high fibre and plenty of protein? Now, of course, one of the things we think about in social leadership is not just how can I be a great leader, enable others to be so. How can I act as a guardian of the space? Indeed, this is one of the things that social leaders do most importantly. They create spaces and they hold open a space. And by a space, I don't just mean a chat room or a meeting room. I mean a space of uncertainty or ambiguity, a space of questioning or exploration. A safe space where people can bring their uncertainty and fear. It's one of the things that we do is we hold open a space and we nurture and support the conversations and the people that are in that space. That doesn't mean being nice to people. It might be that we nurture a space by challenging it, by holding it to account, by holding it to a higher standard. But we should certainly be thinking about our capability to, to do this, to support a community, to, to nurture it, to enable it, to set these spaces up. I, um, I identified three areas um, when I wrote the handbook originally, uh, three aspects of, of sharing. What's the context into which we are sharing something? What channel or channels are we going to share that thing through? And how timely is the thing that we share? Uh, one thing that's reasonably clear is that um, if I share something with you which is relevant, I interpret it as such, but it's not timely. It's going to be of less value than if it's both relevant and timely. So again, that mindful loop before we broadcast something into the system can be particularly valuable. In terms of the channel, when I wrote the handbook originally, the first edition in 2014, I was predominantly thinking about which channel do you choose to share it in from the point of view of reach you know, what's likely to allow the greatest effect. But since then, having completed the um, first phase of the landscape of trust research, what's become fairly clear is we also need to think about what is the implication of the channel that we share something in with regards to both the validity and the trust that people put in the story that's shared. So in the landscape of trust research, we saw quite clearly that people trust formal technologies about 30 percent less than they trust social ones and by that they mean a system which is owned by an organization they trust a bit less than a system which is democratized and open so perhaps here we are meeting on zoom which is a free and open tool that any of us can set up and any of us can use my last call was using skype for business which is a system owned by an organization so when they were recording the meeting it felt very formal indeed um, and so we moderate our behavior as such so the channel in which the thing is shared can impact both on our willingness to share it and the willingness of others to respond and that's quite interesting because one of the challenges um, people often face one of the questions i get asked quite often is um, we're sharing lots of material out there but nobody's really responding to it well, these are the kind of questions you have to ask. You may be sharing relevant material, but it's just not timely because everybody's busy. We may be sharing relevant material, but in the wrong channel. Uh, and that's important because you may be sharing it into your formal space. But if all of the relevant conversations are going on over in Facebook or on WhatsApp, sharing it into the wrong space. So it may be formal and permitted, but it may still be wrong. And what's the context in which we're sharing it? It's, 
interestingly, when you survey groups about how they feel about content which is shared, especially content which is shared by people who are more senior than them, the top thing they often comment on is that they lack the space to respond. And that's quite interesting from a, a mindset perspective, is thinking, when I share something, am I broadcasting a story? Or am I getting into a conversation about it? I think it's very easy for people, especially higher up the system, to believe that they're broadcasting, that they're just sending out the right story to the organization. But in the context of the social age and the democratized nature of communication and technology, we've all got pretty used to responding to stories. So if somebody shares a story, no matter how senior they are, I might feel I've got a right and indeed a space and a capability and a voice to respond to that story. So we quite often see that one of the key frustrations in organizations is not that they disagree with the story that's shared from up high, but that they lack the space and opportunity to pick it up and add something of themselves to it. That's why when we think about storytelling, we have to really focus on the nature of co-created stories. How will people with formal power be humble enough to listen to people who have no formal power? And between the two, how can they co-create a new story, one that builds on the best of the old? In fact, this illustration, I thought I'd pull this in. This is a, a, a forward-facing piece of work. So um, some of you, uh, you know a few of the names on this call will have uh, seen uh, or know that I'm just finishing up at the moment, Change Handbook. And this is one of the uh, prototype illustrations for the Change Handbook. So this, this illustration won't appear in the book, but a sort of second generation, uh, which will be drawn off this, uh, will be. One of the things I've taken to doing with books is, is um, illustrating them as I go, with the sort of working out loud illustrations. And then when I've pulled them all together, I'll often redraw from scratch and find a style for the book. So this, uh, the image will change, but the story will remain. And the story here about sharing is um, what story are we sharing? Are we sharing an individual story or an organizational story? In the context, again, of social learning and social leadership, what we're often trying to do is build a future which is based upon, which draws upon those two types of story, the story of the individual contextualized and held within the story of the organization. What we're not trying to do is batter people with the organizational story until they shut up and stop trying to share their individual story. What's interesting, if we look at uh, big organizations, if we look at an organization like the National Health Service in the UK, it's a very big organization. It's a complex organization. It's full of vertical structures. It's functionally differentiated and it's highly conflicted. There's a lot of disagreement and, and uh, oppositional force between different areas. What's happened within that system is we see a lot of people have expert or reputation powered voices, but they may be quite low down in the formal structure. But it's no coincidence that in a world of collaborative technology and democratized storytelling, we see many of those people who lack formal power within the system are claiming formal power outside the system through their blogs, either um, which ones which they sign or anonymized, through Twitter accounts, where they're building often quite substantial reputation-led communities, giving power and amplification to their voice. So it's hard in some ways to divorce the notion of sharing from the context that we do it within and the type of power that sits behind it. But certainly I've de deliberately drawn these arrows the same size because one of the interesting effects of the social age is that it's generally seeing a depowering of formal stories which are less credible and deemed to be less authentic and an empowering of individual voices, particularly practitioner voices, authentic voices grounded in um, grounded in truth, grounded in a lived reality. <coughs> this, um, for those of you that have been following this series, you'll have seen this slide before, 
but um, it's one of my favorites. It was actually one of the very first uh, illustrations that I drew for the 100 Days book, and it represents the way that we use stories. I sometimes use it to remind uh, people in organizations that stories are not neutral things. Um, stories are always imbued with context, with a type of power, and with a, a certain validity or authenticity. And what we tend to do is we collect together our ammunition and we then fire these stories out. We fire them up the organization, we fire them across the organization, and we fire them down the organization. And some of them get battered and fail, and some of them survive, but they're filtered through different mechanisms. Formal stories are filtered through sign-off committees and subject matter experts and legal teams. But socially held stories, what I normally call socially moderated stories, are filtered still, but they're filtered through communities. They're filtered through our fear of consequence. They're filtered through our understanding of other people's realities. So understanding this battleground of, of stories and the ways they interact and respond and either nullify or empower other stories is a really important foundation for sharing our own story. If we don't understand this environment that we're casting it into, then we're almost destined to fail uh, from the start. And this, to reinforce the point really, this is one of, um, one of what I call my sort of foundation slides. So I, I quite often, if I'm running a program, uh, next week I'm running a full week program in Munich, and this will be the first slide that I'll share on the first day, uh, because it's about the foundations of the social age. And it's about the reality that all of our storytelling takes place within and the context of social leadership. On the left hand side, you have the formal structure of the organization. So if you've got a job title, you have a position within a hierarchy, and the hierarchy is part of the formal system. Your employment contract is part of the formal system. Your company car and laptop are part of the formal system. Formal structures are clear to understand. We know who has the power to do things within them, we know who has the power to invoke consequence within them. We understand largely how stories flow within them. But on the other side is social, the social system, the network of uh, trusted relationships, pragmatic relationships, of tribes, of communities, the ways that we come together. Now there are some fundamental differences between these two systems and not just the obvious ones. Um, your, your formal system is one dimensional. You only have one of those even if it's really big and complex, ultimately you can still draw a line between any two aspects of it. The social system is radically complex, it's unknowably complex, and it's multi-layered and concurrently conflicted. So you don't just have one social system, you have many different social systems that you're part of. And there's not just, uh, as in the formal system, the formal system scales in a linear manner forever, but the social system, collapses down into granular tribal trust bonded units. We exist in tribal structures that come together into community structures that may be held within formal organizational structures. But the thing in all of that that's real are those close social ties, the people that we really trust. So these two systems live in conflict with each other. It doesn't have to be a a bad type of conflict, but there is a friction that exists between them. Our challenge is to recognize the value of both systems. We need formal systems with incredibly strong formal leadership, formal channels of communication and broadcast and sharing. But we also need incredibly strong social systems with socially moderated forms of power, socially moderated and validated stories, and the sharing of those stories. So at any given moment, we should understand, am I sharing something within the formal system or am I sharing it through the social system? Is my story backed by the power of the formal organization or is it backed by the power of consensus of the community? What type of story is it? How am I sharing it? Where am I sharing it? And then of course, where will I hear the response to it? 
because for a formal story, there's going to be noise in the social system as people respond. But are we humble enough to listen out for that noise and to respect and recognize the things that we hear? It's all very well saying, we're going to open up a space to hear your stories and responses. But if we don't respond to those properly, we might as well not have bothered. Understanding the dynamic tension between formal and social systems is extremely important. Odan saying the benefit um, uh, could be formal structure encourages social structures to sense check formal stories and sharing. I think that's right, you know, in a high functioning social system and formal system, so what I would call a socially dynamic system, then exactly the two can benefit from this dynamic tension. If we get it right, we maintain this tension. If we get it wrong, we allow one side to collapse the other. So if the formal system triumphs and silences social voices, we become extremely good at replicability and consistency, but we may be poor at curiosity and innovation. If the social system subverts the formal, it may be very excitable, may be very creative, but it may be unable to manage risk, unable to achieve effect at scale, because it can't develop consistency and conformity. And we need those things as well. So I think our challenge is to develop fantastic formal leaders and fantastic social leaders. And for both sides to have the humility to listen to each other and find the meaning in this dynamic tension in the middle. So I've talked a little about this, the interpretation of stories. As we throw something into the system, we should be thinking about the context, the relevance, and the timeliness. And this takes us to a very specific skill which we can develop. In the 100 days journey, I you know, actively encourage people to go out and, and try this. So pick up a story and interpret it to be relevant and timely to the person that we're sharing it with. So we can think about that active interpretation where we try to put together a story, or we can think about a facilitating type of interpretation where we say, I'm not sure what the relevance is, but I think this is important. What sense do we make of it? So inviting other voices to take part. And funnily enough, inviting other voices to take part can be more valuable than providing our own interpretation because people like to have their voice heard within a system. I've only measured this once in a pharmaceutical company where we were trying to build some quite high functioning fellowship communities. And it turned out that people wanted access to expertise. They wanted to meet people who were global uh, leading researchers in certain fields. But when you ask them what they wanted from that meeting, they didn't particularly want to hear what those people were saying because they could read what they said or they could watch what they said elsewhere. They wanted to have the opportunity to discuss what was being said, but also they wanted to be able to share their own knowledge back into the system. They wanted to get into a debate and a dialogue. They wanted to co-create. So I think that's quite an important um, aspect to consider. The next piece is, is quite important and I suspect it's one of the hardest challenges for formal leaders as they look to develop their social leadership. Because in our formal positions, we're taught to rely on certainty and we're taught to make decisions and we're taught to stick with what we've decided. In many systems, it's a sign of weakness to change your mind or to simply say, I'm not sure yet what to think about this or what to do about this. And yet the reality is that we're often pretty uncertain about a lot of things. What we fear is the judgment which will be imposed upon us because of that. For social leaders, I think we have to learn to share our uncertainty. So we're not sharing content and we're not sharing a story. What we're really sharing is vulnerability. We're sharing the uncertainty of not knowing all of the answers, but being willing to engage with a community to find them. In many ways, the sharing of uncertainty represents what social leadership is. It's not power that comes through position. It's power 
that comes through holding open these spaces and facilitating the community to find the answer. But it's also about the humility to change your mind and to recognize when you're wrong. Humility is a, a really important notion in social leadership. Uh, the blog I wrote yesterday was about why kindness counts. But in the, and, and I talked a little bit about how we sometimes view kindness as a soft skill, as if it's somehow less important, um, somehow less strong than hard skills. But humility is another one of these notions. Humility isn't about being sort of soft or weak or wrong. It's almost about being strong enough to listen to the views of others. Uh, one of the things I say in the essay about, so about humility is that it's about being willing to view the success of others uh, before we view our own success, to, to literally to take pride in the success of others more than in our, our own success. But sharing uncertainty is easy to talk about. It's very hard to do when you're in a political uh, or contentious type of environment. But I think it's, um, for me anyway, in the social leadership work, this notion of sharing uncertainty is one of the, the most important aspects to, to consider. There's another um, context of sharing which is uh, the things that we share into the system, the support that we offer within the system. There's a, a whole body of work within the social leadership uh, area, which I look at of social capital, which is um, a little bit like the force in Star Wars, I guess. It's this thing which flows through everything and makes the, the system work effectively. So I sometimes say that social capital is the ability to survive and thrive in the context of the social age, but also, crucially, to help others to survive and thrive, to ensure that nobody is left behind. Now, people can be left behind for all sorts of reasons. They can be left behind because they simply don't have an understanding of all the opportunity to build an understanding of the new reality. They can be left behind because people actively disenfranchise them or disempower them and they do that through rules or starvation of opportunity or straightforward denial. They can be accidentally left behind, perhaps because we unintentionally create environments where people who are charismatic, um, who are highly um, articulate, are able to steal a lead. People who are photogenic, you know, in a, in a world of beautiful people, we can find that uh, we only you know, put people like that up on our screens. There's all sorts of reasons. You may have seen a, 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 a Twitter hashtag going around recently about um, the exact hashtag that's people in wheelchairs who are um, tweeting pictures about being beautiful, being both disabled and beautiful, and being proud of it, and wearing great clothing, and claiming a voice within a system. In fact, that speaks to the nature of claimed voices within a system, is that people are able to do that. So thinking about helping hands is very important. When we think about sharing, what we may be sharing is a willingness to help other people, to reach out and uh, do something, not just share an asset or a resource or uncertainty, but to actually reach out and help them to achieve something. But again, to do this requires two things. It requires us to be willing to invest something of ourselves within the system, but it also requires us to be connected into the right people to have these high function communities. This is really why I've sandwiched sharing in social leadership between uh, storytelling and community, because you have to have the foundations in place. You have to be able to shape and share your stories, but then you have to understand how communities work and how you can build um, and operate within and alongside those those communities. I, um, I thought I'd share this because uh, one of the things I uh, try to do as part of working out loud is, is share things that I no longer think are particularly true. So this was uh, one of the illustrations from the first book, uh, which 
was illustrating uh, nodes and amplifiers and really representing a very established wisdom about how messaging flows through social systems that some people are highly interconnected and if you can build your community to include those people who are interconnected and they have communities going out from them then your story can be shared and spread further now this illustration is not wrong um, if you build your community so that it has some highly connected people within it people with high social capital and if they like your story then it will be shared out further but it turns out there's a surprising scarcity of good research into how stories are actually amplified through systems and by what mechanisms they're amplified there's been quite a resurgence of interest in this uh, following the uh, american elections last year to understand the effects of um, stories spreading through communities and particularly the resistance of people to alter their view of the world as a result of that. It turns out that there's a disproportionate effect of a single highly connected individual. So in reality what happens is some stories spread through this type of system, incremental acceleration, but the majority of stories that spread really fast do so because one individual who doesn't have a particular quality of connection but just has an awful lot of connections picks it up and dumps it into that system so i guess that's obvious but it's often not factored into the thinking about how stories spread in fact i still talk about as social leaders what we're trying to do is not not build the biggest network we can we're trying to build a diverse network. And that I think still holds to be very true. In the research into trust, I've been looking at this because what's quite clear is that as your network grows, it doesn't automatically diversify. In fact, the opposite seems to happen. It tends to continue to grow in the likeness in which you started it. If we want to diversify our network, we'll have to consciously and actively put effort into that diversification. There's uh, quite a simple thing that we can think about sharing, which is sharing time. So we're all very busy. Uh, we're often uh, thinking about, well, what, you know, what can we share? And um, we think about what, what can we share and uh, in terms of assets or stories, but a, a very simple thing that we can share is time, the ability to help other people out. Indeed, within the uh, Social Leadership 100 Days book, I, I talk about this, you know, when do you feel that you can just reach out and offer somebody a little bit of your time? And interestingly, the further up you are within an organization, the greater people value that kind of intervention. There's an interesting form of power for formal leaders to develop, which is the sort of back channel power of reaching out to one person to say thank you, or reaching out to one person to say, can I help you with that thing? It's not something that's done very commonly. We tend with our senior leadership power to operate in a broadcast mode at scale. But sharing time with individuals can help you to build a diverse network of people um, outside your immediate uh, try if you're immediate circle. Sharing our connections can be very powerful as well and it speaks to an interesting feature of um, social leadership and this is that um, we, we're not just trying to build one type of power, we're trying to build a very diversified type of power Within our social leadership communities, we take many different roles. Sometimes we do take a straightforward leadership role. Sometimes we take a storytelling role, or a subject matter expert role, or the role of a joker, or the role of a challenger. But one very interesting role is the role of the, uh, the cross-connector, somebody who bridges between different communities. 
And when I'm talking to people actually about curation, the very first step of social leadership, choosing their space, I'll often encourage them to think about this role. Because remember that point I made, that as we grow our communities, they don't tend to automatically diversify. What that means is that for an entire socially dynamic system, a whole organization, having a subset of people who are extremely good at cross-connecting is a, a very valuable thing to break us out of our silos. And often once we have broken out, then we can build a whole new part of our network in that new space. So sometimes in social systems, we take many different roles contextually, but some of those roles are very quiet and hidden roles that can be particularly important ones. The coaching roles, the facilitation roles, um, these all speak to having high social capital. So a very conscious thing we can do is pick somebody up with their story and introduce them into a new space. Now this came up quite recently in the NHS communities of practice research we've been doing, parts of which I've already published and I'll, I'll be um, publishing a, a full uh, white paper on that um, a little later in the summer. But when we asked people about their most valuable communities, um, they said the top 20% of communities they're part of are ones which they've been vouched into. They're not open communities that they would have found by looking around themselves. It's a community where somebody has reached out and said, hey, I think you would bring something to this community. I think you would benefit from this community. Can I introduce you to this community? And those uh, people described as their most valuable communities. And when you look even deeper into that, when we said, why were they valuable? How, you know, how did they become so valuable? People um, describe that they bring new knowledge, that they bring uh, challenge, but they also describe how the most important thing is the way they are welcomed into that community. Single most important thing is the ritual and the choreography of engagement into a community. And that's something which anybody can learn how to do, or any of our communities can learn how to do. Um, so this role for a social leader of being a cross-connector and of understanding the choreography of engagement and how we become a high-functioning member of the community, I think is a very valuable one to explore further. The, um, I mentioned earlier that people can be disenfranchised, can be disempowered for all sorts of reasons. We can be left behind because we simply don't have a voice in the system. Oh, I'm going out over the road, I'm not sure if you can hear that. These are the perils of living by the fire station. Um, people can be left voiceless for all sorts of reasons. They may be left voiceless because uh, of their gender, because of their seniority within the system. Uh, they may be left disempowered because of cultural norms. They may be uh, left voiceless because they lack an understanding of technology. But I think any conversation about sharing has to be coupled with an understanding, not just of how we share, but of how we help and nurture and support other people to do so. And this again was something that came up in the research. In the uh, community practice research, we looked at stories and the sharing of stories and asked people what they really needed in order to be effective within the system. Well, what about examples of good stories? How many people do you think wanted to see examples of great stories? It was less than 1%. Less than 1% of people said, I really need to see an example of a great story. We know what great stories are. We're great storytellers ourselves. Over 50% of people said, the thing that I really want is mentoring or coaching in storytelling. Now, for me, what that speaks of is not that they needed to be told how to do it, but they wanted some kind of safe space, some kind of support, some kind of permission to experiment with and try these things out. And perhaps this is one of the most important roles for social leaders, not to develop their own strong voice, but to be very finely tuned in 
to where the weak voices or the missing voices are in the system and to create the space, the opportunity, the support for those people to find their voice. And of course, to remember that in the context of social leadership, finding your voice doesn't mean you have to be the loud person on the stage. It may be that people who uh, are not confident, who don't have that capability, may develop, may curate their social leadership in another space. Maybe they'll be storytellers. Maybe they will be people who respond with kindness. Maybe they will be people who offer to proof and support the quality of work that others do. There's all sorts of spaces we can take within these communities. But we must always be aware that as technology opens up new opportunities for us to engage, it almost certainly disenfranchises just as many people and steals their power away. We may accidentally end up in a social age where some people are left ever weaker than they were before. So what can we be generous with? Well, we've talked a little bit about being generous with time. Being generous with our resources may be something, allowing people to come and be part of our team giving access to resource. A generosity of spirit, that might take us dangerously close to kindness, but a generosity of spirit is something that we would want to get. Connections we've talked about. And a generosity of energy is quite interesting. I'm very interested in the energy of social systems because one of the things we see, for example, uh, just a couple of days ago, I was working with an organization that runs a whole series of communities of practice. And they said some of them are highly energetic and some of them are just dead in the water. There's just nothing going on whatsoever. Well, how do we get energy into those systems? It's a funny thing. No matter how energetic you are, you can't pour energy into a system and make it active. You can't push a social system into a higher energy state. Instead, what you have to do is forge broad and diverse connections open up storytelling channels, open up spaces, listen with humility in the system, recognize and reward people, and kind of get the system as a whole to kick into action. And sometimes that can even include us recognizing that a particular community space has had its time, that we should be closing that space down. But a generosity with our energy, sharing energy, is important, but doing so in the right way. You can't push a system to momentum. That's a theme I'm exploring further in the change handbook, which I'll, uh, I'm working over the next few weeks to, to get finished. People who know me might be laughing at that because I've been saying that for the last year, but I'm getting there. Thank you. This isn't just a thank you to you, but thank you for being part of this today. But we can, of course, be generous with our thanks. We can share thank yous into a system. That may sound like a really lame thing to say, but let me give you an example. In the Metropolitan Police in the UK, there were around 10,000 leaders with the rank of sergeant right up to chief superintendent. The commissioner right at the top. Those people are organized in six different layers, six different leadership layers. When people in the top layer do something good, uh, Quest the Dip, who is the um, uh, chief superintendent, uh, the uh, commissioner, uh, writes a thank you letter to them. So it's not uncommon for people to get a handwritten thank you letter. If you exist down at layer six, if you're a sergeant out in Clapham, you are not going to get a letter from Cressida. She shares her letters in one layer. Now, she's a good leader in a formal system, but a leader in a social system would recognize the value of sharing thanks more widely because thank yous and gratitude doesn't have to flow down through a hierarchy. It can flow around the edge and it can have really significant benefits to do so, especially if that thank you comes with an opportunity to share further views or to listen. One of the interesting projects I ran in one of the um, uh, big engineering company, an aerospace company, uh, where we identified really good social storytellers and gave them an opportunity to define their own reward. And what they said was, well, what we want is lunch with the chief executive. 
fair enough, I was able to organize that. We gave those storytellers lunch with the chief executive. And then I said to them, well, I've got to brief the chief executive. He's willing to host lunch for you, but he wants to know what do you want him to talk about? And they said, we don't want him to talk. We want him to listen. And that was you know, quite a salutary lesson for me, is that this notion I referred to it earlier, when we share, we also need to create space to listen. And perhaps when we share thank yous to a system, we can also share opportunities uh, to contribute something back the other way. If we do this right, if we build social leadership out effectively, we'll build this distributed sense-making capability. Sense-making being the ability to find out what the picture is. It's not quite as simple as a jigsaw. The picture that we're trying to build in the social age doesn't have lots of edges that we can find first and some corners and then the middle bit that we fill in. It's an ever-changing picture. We need the ability to form a picture, to take it apart, to revise our understanding, to share our uncertainty, to share knowledge, to share capability, to share resources and time, to do all of that generously, and to build around us the communities which will allow us in the moment to find the most relevant picture in the moment. In all of this, it's our actions that count more than our words. The reputation of social leaders is based not on the words that they utter, it's based on the things that they do. So ultimately, sharing is an activity through which we may earn reputation. If we share the right things with the right type of energy in the right spaces, it can be part of, of reputation. That's something we'll be exploring in a couple of sessions uh, further down in these webinars. So I'll draw this uh, together, to the end of the session on um, sharing. Thank you for bearing with me through that. The next session, which Sam will give us details of again in a minute, is on um, communities. And uh, that's one of my favorites because we can explore all sorts of different types of community. So if you have any questions about this, do uh, ping it in. The webinar will go up on YouTube. So uh, we'll have the first generation and the second generation of these up together. And uh, we've got a couple of minutes if anybody has any questions. Over to you, Sam. Thank you, Julian. While well, people are just uh, uh, thinking about any questions for you to drop into the chat, uh, thank you very much. That was, that was a, I think that went really well. Great, a great format for the webinar. Very interesting. Um, having been fortunate enough to sit on quite a few of these, uh, it's great to see the way that we are experimenting and we're trying new ways to to communicate. And I'd welcome any feedback from the viewers. Um, and there's a comment here from Hoda. Let me just read this out. No question, just comments. Kindness is important to me. As a hem is to a garment. Oh, hem is to a garment. Oh, it's a lovely phrase. Yeah. <laughs> Quite right. Thank you, hey Dan. That's great. Thank you. <laughs> In case there are any more questions, uh, I'll just let you know again. Yeah, the community session that's happening on the twelfth of June, and that's UK time, two p.m. And you'll be able to follow along on Twitter for any updates to that. And as I said earlier, we'll be sending an email across uh, after this session to everyone who's registered. That will contain links to this video and previous videos. And if you have any questions, feel free to, to reply to that email. We can pick that up and we'll get in touch with us in all the usual ways. Excellent. Uh, you are welcome too, Hodan. Thank you for your comments today. That's very kind. And at that point, I will say thank you very much and we'll finish the session. Good. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, everybody. See you next time.